Hello, I am Dr. Sandy Marecki, and our country is in a very difficult time. This is November of 2022, and we just saw another election stolen from We the People. You may feel a little bit down, but I'm here to tell you that there is actually a solution. And I'm going to give you a talk about how to save America. So that is my email address. You can write it down now or you can uh, write it down later. I will have it at the end of the talk. We have a big problem in America. Patriots across the nation are trying to figure out how to remove the current corrupt government lawfully and peacefully, if at all possible. Patriots are running for political offices in the hopes of replacing the corrupt officials with honest officials. But the corrupt government has control of the political parties, the voting machines, and the voting systems. And so we will never have fair elections. Lawsuits won't work because the entire judicial system is also corrupt. How did things get so bad? Well, unfortunately, we the people were asleep, and I was definitely one of them. So what if I told you that the corruption stems from the fact that the United States is not a constitutional republic anymore? That's what our founding fathers gave us in the Constitution, Bill of Rights, every, all of our founding documents. Well, what's happened is our country is a corporation owned by foreign powers, called in all caps, the government of the United States, or sometimes United States Incorporated. I'm going to prove to you that this is true. It's also known by a variety of other names throughout time, but always in capital letters indicating a corporation. Wait, what? You're probably saying to yourself, for those who have not heard this before. So let me show you the corporate registry on a website called Dun & Bradstreet which is where all corporations are registered. So dnb.com. You can go and verify this yourself. And in fact, I highly recommend that you verify everything I'm telling you. Go look it up. I will give you the websites here in the presentation. I will also give you the websites in the description of this video, below the video. So first we look up government of the United States. Well, there it is under Dun & Bradstreet. There is the link. And although the printing is very small, I took a screenshot and I will point out some key information. The principal of this corporation is Joseph R. Biden Jr. The address of the corporation is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. And the website is www.usa.gov. Okay. Well, is every part of the government a corporation? Pretty much. So here's the Department of Defense Corporation. For some reason, they never updated the uh, CEO of this corporation. Uh, it's currently still set as Chuck Hagel under the sec, uh, SecDef under Obama from 2013 to 2015. But the address is the Pentagon and the website is www.defense.gov. Keeps going on. How about the U.S. Supreme Court Corporation? Well, Justice John G. Roberts is in charge. The address is the Supreme Court address and their website is supremecourt.gov. One more time. NASA, NASA Corporation, currently run by Bill Nelson, who is the NASA director. The address is NASA headquarters in Washington, DC and their website is nasa.gov. Please go verify this. I am not lying to you. So people are still doubting this corporation theory. However, it can't be any more clear than reading the actual U.S. code, in this case, 28 U.S.C. 3002. Cornell University has a law library online, and you can look this up. Paragraph 15 says, United States means a, a federal corporation. If this wasn't true, why would they put this here? In addition, agencies, departments, commissions, boards, or any other thing under the United States or any instrumentality of the United States. I don't know how to argue against that. So basically you're asking yourself, what happened? How did we get here? 
Well, our founding fathers, like I said, gave us a constitutional republic. It had never before been attempted in human history. America never was a democracy and never will be a democracy. Anyone who used the, uses the word democracy in a conjunction with the United States of America is totally crazy. It will never be a democracy. Our founding fathers despised democracies because they had always failed throughout history, usually committed suicide, kind of like what ours is doing right now. So there's a quote of the day that is the distinction between a constitutional republic and a democracy. It's often attributed to Benjamin Franklin, but there's no evidence of this. It's a great quote anyway. A democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting for what to have for lunch. A constitutional republic is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote. There's your difference. Ever wonder why they were always going after our weapons? So hopefully all of us have learned in school that the original Republic has three main branches, the executive, the legislative and, judi and judicial. However, there are two other branches that have to do with we the people and our legal uh, lawful right to assemble. We won't go into that here. That's a whole other video. Of course, under the executive branch is the president, vice president. Under the legislative branch is the House and the Senate, Congress. Under the, <laughs> under the judicial is the Supreme Court. So the president and the vice president, back in the day when it was original constitution, the vice president was actually the person who came in second in the election, not in the same party, typically. So wouldn't that be interesting to have currently Biden as the president and Trump as the vice president. <laughs> I would think that'd be hilarious. So, of course, we have one of each. So in the House, original Republic, now when the 13 colonies were stood up as the United States of America, there were 65 representatives in the House of Representatives. I have unfortunately the boxes would be too small, so you're going to have to just bear with me on my simplistic representation. They were, of course, all the seats were filled with elections. And then in the Senate, there were two senators per state, 13 states, 26, again, a partial representation. Those seats were filled. And then the Supreme Court at the time had 11 Supreme Court justices. So 10 plus a Supreme Supreme, I guess. And those were filled. What's interesting, little history, is the Supreme Court actually varied between six and 11 members over the years. And then it was settled on having only nine, exactly nine, in the act of 1869. And that's how many we've had ever since. So of course, as more states were added to the union, Congress and the Senate grew over time. Unfortunately, again, I don't have room to make all these little boxes. So you're gonna have to just use your imagination. Unfortunately, our country faced a more very, very difficult time in the Civil War, which started in April of 1861. In total, 11 states had left the Union, so there were 23 states remaining. There were 34 at the time, total. So there is some debate about whether states could lawfully leave the Union. Was that something that the Founding Fathers had originally intended? Well, at any, at any rate, they did. So we could probably do another video on that. So, like I said, 34 state, uh, there were 34 states before the Civil War, 234 congressmen, 68 senators, and nine justices. When the Civil War started, there were 23 states, 180 congressmen, 46 senators, and all the nine justices were still there. So that's what was left. So there were a lot of vacancies. This was called a rump congress, which means there is a smaller part remaining. So President Lincoln had a huge problem. He believed firmly that once the states had signed into the union, they were bound to it and could not leave. Unfortunately, it was nothing written down. Later, after the Civil War, the US Supreme Court ruled on a case called Texas versus White. And in 1869, they determined that a state could not leave the union unless they had the approval of both the House and the Senate, 
I'm assuming a majority vote, plus ratification by three-fourths of the state legislatures allowing that state to leave. Can you imagine trying to get three-fourths of the states to agree on anything right now or ever? So this is a nearly impossible task, but at least it's now in writing. So at the time of the Civil War, seceding from the Union was considered an insurrection. So in order to preserve the Union, Lincoln had to perform some drastic actions. First, he declared martial law wherever there was fighting or in any of the seceded states. With the martial law came the suspension of habeas corpus, which resulted in the suspension of speedy trials for anyone accused of a crime. In other words, someone could be held in prison indefinitely. Another thing is that he considered the seats of the seceded states vacant, but not deleted. So it would have been very difficult for the House and the Senate to have a majority to vote on bills and other things because he's considered those, considering those votes to be abstained. Maybe most profound though, is the establishment of what he called executive government. That suspended large portions of the constitution and created a government that was more corporate than Republic. Now there's probably people who would argue with this, but I want you to go take a look at Lincoln's proclamations dated September 22nd, 1862 and January 1 of 1863, where he clearly uses the term executive government that had never been used before. So when the Civil War started, the martial law and executive government were enacted without a vote by the House or the Senate or the states or the people. Lincoln felt that he had to do this in order to save the Union. He planned to revert back to the Constitutional Republic as soon as the war was over and the Union was restored. However, I think we all remember that he was assassinated in April of 1865, only a few days after the end of the Civil War, and he never was able to bring it back to the Constitutional Republic. The United States has remained a corporation in some form ever since. So the executive government at the time of the Civil War, when the states had left, is on the left-hand side of the screen. And so what Lincoln did was he created a carbon copy of the constitutional government, and he calls it the executive government. And what essentially he did was he took all the people and moved them over to his executive government. And that's how they did business. The Republic was abandoned, but not abolished. The seats were still there, unfilled, this whole time since 1861. So as the Southern states came back into the Union, the empty seats were, of course, refilled. And then over time, new states were added. Again, limitation of my simple diagram. I can't put any more boxes, but use your imagination. So the corporation. After Lincoln's assassination, President Johnson, not a good guy, kept the corporate system and then built upon it. The 14th Amendment was unlawfully passed by the corporate Congress in 1868 to help explain the citizenship of black men, but instead it changed the citizen of the United States to U.S. citizen. You may not think that's a significant change, but however, it affected everyone and it violated the Constitution. So now U.S. citizenship usurped the state citizenship, which was the supreme citizenship. And this was for the first time in American history. So what does all this mean? Well, all the people within the United States became slaves to the corporation, but the people used as collateral on the nation's debt. All states and counties were also required to become incorporated in order to have dealings with the government of the United States, because you can only have corporations working with corporations. Congress did not lawfully vote for any of this, and especially because Congress was now this corporate entity. So I'm gonna to prove to you that the states also became corporations. So under Dun & Bradstreet, again, you can look this up. The state of Colorado has its own entry and under there, the principal CEO is Jared Polis, who is the governor of Colorado. 
and the addresses and the websites all line up. Secretary of State, so every other entity under the Colorado government has to also be incorporated. And so you can look up Secretary of State, Treasurer, you know, you name it, they're here. Jenna Griswold, Anybody, everyone in Colorado knows this person, unfortunately. State of Illinois, Governor Pritzker. State of Florida, Ron DeSantis. Do you think Ron DeSantis doesn't know that he is the CEO of the State of Florida Corporation? He knows. They all know, in fact. They're all told once they enter office for the very first time. So in 1871, the debt of the United States could not be paid to the international bankers. The Civil War had done tremendous damage to this country. And essentially the bankers had funded both sides of the war as they always do. The bankers proposed an agreement between the Vatican, the city of London, and the United States known as the District of Columbia. Coincidentally, these are the only three, quote, city-states in the entire world. And now they were becoming some sort of allies. And this link here at the bottom of the page is a good summary of what's going on. So this act of 1871 created a new separate corporate government that resides in the 10 mile square parcel of land known as the District of Columbia. And at that moment, common law, which is the law of the constitution, the law of the land, the law of the people, was changed to maritime law corporate law. The Constitution did not allow for anything like this. And without the authority to do so, Congress had committed an act of treason against the sovereign inhabitants of the Republic. So the three parts of the agreement essentially made the Vatican the CEO, the City of London the CFO, the Chief Financial Officer, and the United States was the military arm. Well, that would explain a lot of reasons why the U.S. has been involved in so many endless useless wars. And the Constitution for the United States of America noticed the capitalization and not capitalization of this sentence, phrase. It became all caps, Constitution of the United States of America. You might think that's not a big change, but it means everything in the courts and the legal system. Essentially, it became a corporate document and stole all of our sovereign rights. So Benjamin, Fra Benjamin Franklin had given us a very stern warning. Upon leaving Independence Hall in 1787, after days and days of going through the possibilities of what kind of government to have, and they finally decided. Mrs. Powell outside had asked him, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? He replied, a republic, if you can keep it. Unfortunately, we've lost it. So there's a great summary of everything I just talked about so far about when the United States became a corporation here on the libertybeacon.com. And as a side note, although it could probably be its own video again, there is a missing 13th Amendment that I would love for you guys to go take a look at. In summary, bar attorneys are not considered citizens of the United States because they cannot hold any political office because they took a foreign oath. So, the amendment was ratified in 1819. It was included in the constitutions of the states and the federal up to 1870, and then removed without cause, illegally. So the impact is that every act of Congress that has attorneys in the mix is unconstitutional. Things are bad enough at this point, but they got much worse. The Federal Reserve. The conspiracy of rich elites and bankers converged on Jekyll Island, Georgia in 1910 in utter secrecy. The Creature from Jekyll Island is a book written by G. Edward Griffin, and I highly, highly recommend that you put this down as your homework. I will put a link to the audio, free audio book that you can listen to this book online. 
These gentlemen secretly came up with a plan to enslave the United States with a central bank. They proposed the creation of the Federal Reserve, which was a separate entity that would take over all monetary obligations. Before this, the U.S. did not have a central bank because President Thomas Jefferson had gotten rid of the previous one. They're bad. Then in 1913, Representative Carter Glass had proposed the Federal Reserve Bill in the House and the similar one in the Senate. And eventually it was passed and signed into law on December 23rd, 1913 by President Woodrow Wilson, who was actually a self-professed communist as one of our presidents. Hmm, this was right before 1914. Something big happened in 1914. You guys remember? Yeah, the start of World War I. Probably not a coincidence. And of course, the, of course, the rich bankers had funded all sides of the war. Then came the income tax. So I think we all know the analogy about boiling the frog. Throw a frog into boiling water, it jumps out because it can see the, and sense the danger. But if you put a frog in regular temperature water and you slowly add the heat, he will cook to death and not know what's going on because the changes are too small. They did the same thing to us. They did slow additions over time. The 16th Amendment to the Constitution was also in 1913 and allowed for a personal income tax against the Constitution. This Revenue Act and then the Revenue Act of 1913 lowered the tariff rates on goods. So this is like the sales tax kind of a thing. So 40% to 26%. And then to offset that, they established the 1% tax on personal income above $3,000 per year. Well, now that doesn't sound like a lot, but back then that was only about 3% of the population. So I'm sure, you know, your average citizen was like, well, it doesn't impact me. It's not a big deal. They also established a corporate tax of 1% on all corporations, no matter how big they were. That could have an impact. So Congress had committed treason once again. Then came the IRS. It was also started in 1913, called the Board of Internal Revenue. Never enacted by Congress. In other words, all personal taxes are unconstitutional. Well, they were anyway. So the IRS is responsible for collecting unlawful taxes under the Federal Reserve, not the Department of Treasury, like we're all led to believe. This means that tax money is going to the international bankers not to the country. So I pulled up the Department of Treasury organizational chart. I don't see the IRS anywhere in there. You guys could pull this up as much as I can and take a look and verify. Not there. Now it is listed on the Department of Treasury website, but not in the organization chart. So the birth certificate, boy, the fun just keeps on rolling. In 1906, birth certificates were required. So people were fooled into signing their children into slavery to the federal government. You're like, what? There's actually two different documents that you sign at the hospital and we don't even know. What are they saying to the parents? So the certificate of live birth, this is the one we all have in our possession. It's what the parents are given to verify the birth of the child. And that's what we're told. However, the birth certificate, boy, do they sound the same, was created by the state to make a fraudulent corporation with the child's name in all caps so that you could now be taxed and sued in court because otherwise they can't touch a living man or woman. Did you knowingly agree to selling your children to the government? Social Security. In 1935, the Corporate Congress, of course, passed the Social Security Act. After the intentional collapse of the stock market in 1929, again, listen to G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island, America was thrust into the Great Depression on purpose. While it might have had honorable intentions, the Social Security Act further enslaved the American people by mandating that each worker have a number that tracked them throughout their lifetime. And for those who have lived many years, like some of us, much, much more has happened since then. So what's the bottom line? 
We have not had a lawful constitutional republic since the Civil War in 1861. Slowly over time, the corporate United States, all caps, defrauded the American people. However, here's the good news. A group of patriots, very similar to us, had already figured out how to take back our republic, and they already took it back. The Republic. In nearly 2000s, patriots just like us were already awake to what the corrupt corporate governments were doing at all levels. They scoured our founding documents, looking for answers and solutions. In doing that, they established the fact that our Republic was never abolished, only abandoned. So that meant that we, the people, only needed to figure out how to re-inhabit the Republic. And that's what these patriots did in 2010. They used the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, a document that would uh, discuss what to do about the territories of the Northwest of the colonies, essentially the area of Ohio and places like that. They realized that what they needed to do in order to re-inhabit the vacant federal, state, and local republic, republic governments. So there's the document on the left-hand side, and I highly recommend you go to the archives.gov, which is the link there, and go read it. This was, again, like I was saying, the territories northwest of the Ohio River, which was kind of the border of where the colonies were at the time, and it outlined a process for acquiring statehood. And that sounds like it could be applicable to our situation. So there are three phases as outlined in the ordinance. First, appoint a governor, a secretary, which is essentially the clerk, and then three judges to preside over the territory. Elect an assembly, in other words, a legislature, and then one non-voting delegate to the Congress. So you can start sitting in on the proceedings. And that's when the population reached 5,000 free male inhabitants of full age, or in other words, 5,000 eligible voters. And then the third step was to draft a state constitution with the Bill of Rights and request membership in the union after your population, all people had reached 60,000 total. And that's how a lot of the states were inhabited. So the Northwest Ordinance actually came before the Constitution. It was 1787 and the Constitution was 1791. So the Constitution has additional information on this process. Article 1, Section 1.2.4 states that 30,000 residents qualifies a state for the one congressman. So each state automatically gets two senators and then the one congressman once you have at least 30,000 residents, people. And now let's put this all together. So the Republic was abandoned, not abolished, and that was established by the Republic Patriots. So the seats had been unfilled since 1861, since the corporate on the right-hand side has been running the government fraudulently ever since. So as the Patriots were signing up for the Republic, and they had millions of people at a certain point, the states were able to hold elections once they had their 30,000 people. And then slowly the seats were filling up. The Republic, now assembled and meeting regularly, sent notices to all levels of government that the corporate politicians needed to step down to be replaced with the lawful constitutional Republic representatives. How do you think that went? Right, those notices were ignored. In 2010, the re-inhabited states of the Republic were having their annual meeting, this time in Utah. They realized at that time that they might have the required quorum of states to re-inhabit the country at the federal level. Then on November 14th of 2010, the required quorum signed the Declaration of Intent to re-inhabit the federal level of government, essentially a new Declaration of Independence. And the Republic representatives appointed their first president James Timothy Turner. Interim President Turner took his place. In reality, at this time, there were two parallel governments at the same time in the United States of America. One de jure, lawful, constitutional republic, and one de facto corporation. Then in 2012, representatives of the republic presented their founding documents, including the Proclamation of Claim and Interest to the International Court of Justice at The Hague, the United Nations, the Universal Postal Union, the Committee of 300, and the U.S. 
corporate, Joint Chiefs of Staff. These briefings were required to establish the lawful status of the re-inhabited Republic. Since the corporation had hijacked the American flag as its symbol, the Republic searched, for the, uh, searched the original documents for the flag design and then created and approved a flag for the Republic. And you see it flying there. Same 13 stripes, red and white, as we had before, but now the blue field has the stars arranged in a circle. Why haven't you heard any of this before now? Well, Obama was the president at the time, corporate, of course, and the harassment of the members of the Republic began. President Turner was arrested in 2012, no charges. He remains as a political prisoner to this day in a federal prison in Georgia. Imagine that. Many members of the Republic went underground for their safety. There's a lot of harassment and that caused many patriots to leave the Republic. In fact, now in 2022, some of the states are no longer considered to be fully re-inhabited. So a new president was elected, President James Buchanan Geiger, who honorably serves to this day. So what is the Republic's role in the coming transition? Yeah, you know, we're all praying for that transition, aren't we? The Trump administration had identified the Republic as the interim government once the corporate government is removed. That's gonna take the military and martial law, almost certainly. The Republic will be required to hold lawful elections at every level of government within 120 days of the removal of the corporate government. No machines only paper ballots. In the meantime, the interim state government will consist of five representatives, governor, a justice, a congressman, and two senators, very similar to the Northwest Ordinance. Before the corporate government is removed, if a state can reach 30,000 residents that have pledged allegiance to the Republic, then free elections can occur before the corporate government is removed. Of course, the most important positions will be the county sheriff and then the county clerk. So anyone currently in corporate office is not eligible to serve in the Republic. Let that sink in. So how can you get involved? What can you do? Well, of course you have to join the Republic. Go to the website and sign up for the newsletter Every resident of every age should sign up if they can. It's a very long website name. Republic for the United States of America dot org. Republic for the United States of America dot org. When the Republic residents in your state exceed 30,000, you will be informed of coming elections. Of course, the goal is to form our own Republic government and totally ignore the corporate one until it's removed. Up until 1789, with the ratification of the Constitution, all people within America had state citizenship only. When someone says, you know, where are you a citizen? You would say, I'm a citizen of Colorado. I'm a citizen of Illinois. I'm a citizen of Florida. Once the union was formed, all people had both state citizenship and a citizenship of the United States, meaning I'm an American and a citizen of Colorado. State citizenship, though, was always higher, always more important. However, the 14th Amendment fraudulently reversed that. So one of the things that you can do is to reestablish your state national status. That is to make that the most important part of your citizenship. So here's some homework for you and some more actions. So. I highly recommend you buy the Re-Inhabited books. It's a two volume series by Jean and David Hurtler. You can find them on pretty much any book um, website. I recommend not Amazon. Pick something else if you can. Volume one is the true history of America. And it goes way back. It goes like all the way back to Magna Carta and even before that. It's an outstanding book. Volume two is the history of the Republic re-inhabited. So this is what all these patriots have done to bring back our republic. So join the Free Republic and learn your history, just like I said, that website we've already mentioned. 
go to the website and listen to the Declaration and Proclamation. So some of our members actually read the Declaration and the Proclamation from the Reinhabited Republic. It's also on odyssey.com, you can find it there, or you can just go to the Republic website and you can click on the link to that video. Highly recommend it, or just read it on the website. Learn about what your country really is all about. Also, we're, there are Republic flags available on the website. It may take a while, ordering is kind of a little slow now, but you can fly that at your house. And when people ask you, your flag's a little different. You can explain the Republic and you can recruit, recruit more people. Also, I highly recommend you read the book, The Doctrine of Lesser Magistrates. It's a very small book, but a very important read. So become a state national. There are many different processes to do that. We actually have one in the local Colorado Springs area. Please email me for that information. Also keep the pressure on the school boards and the county commissioners. They truly hate it when the people are involved because they don't want our interference in their corporate government. When you're recruiting people, this is something I have found to be very helpful. If you find somebody who's just absolutely not listening to what you have to say, tell them that, well, I'll tell you what, when you catch up to me, why don't you get in touch with me and I'll bring you up to speed. People really hate to be thought, thinking that they're behind in some way. And I have found this to be a very cool tool to kind of turn the tides on these people who are fully asleep. Of course, spread the word. If you can make this video go viral, that would be outstanding. And we can get more people to join the Republic and take back our country. So here's my email address again, sandy10m at yahoo.com. Please contact me with any questions that you have about this presentation. When I post this online, I will post all of the links and documents that you saw within this presentation plus a whole lot more of stuff that you can learn more about what's actually going on in our country. But I think now that this makes sense to us, why our current, quote, elected politicians are not following the constitution that you and I are following because they're a corporation and their rules are completely different. So thank you for coming and God bless America.